Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's National Mission. We're here to come alongside you as we journey through life under the cross. What does it look like to care for our neighbors in body and soul? How do we tend to our own body and soul? How can we speak up for life? And finally, how do we share the faith with the next generation? Join us as we have these conversations and learn together. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Stephanie Jabauer. Here with my guest today, the Reverend Dr. Christopher Toma. Pastor Toma, welcome. Would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I am the pastor, senior pastor of Our Savior Evangelical Lutheran Church and School in Heartland, Michigan. Um, I am also the executive director of the Body of Christ and the Public Square. I am the father of four kids one of my or well my oldest son just uh, he and his wife just had a child so i'm also a grandfather which i'm pretty excited about congratulations Uh, how awesome thank you yeah i live in michigan i wish sometimes i lived in florida and could take my congregation all the way down to florida except of course they're having a hurricane right now so we uh, pray for them but yes uh, yeah so that's me in a nutshell can you tell us a little bit more what is the body of christ in the public square Well, the Body of Christ in the Public Square is a conference that we do every year here at Our Savior. It started, actually, this is our 10th year and our 22nd event. And essentially what we do is we bring in speakers from all over the country, all over the world, to come in and speak to church and state issues, religious liberty, life, marriage, things like that. Uh, And we have uh, all kinds of different speakers. So, um, for example, we have had Ben Shapiro here. We had Matt Walsh here. This year, uh, Dr. Ben Carson will be with us. He'll be with us in about a week. Our goal is to educate and to bring in what I would call the expert witnesses, uh, people who have a lot of information, a lot of content. Uh, We can educate the listeners relative to Two Kingdoms theology, church and state theology, and then they can go out and be better equipped to engage. So we make a deliberate effort to do these things. And uh, so far, the Lord has blessed uh, the effort over the years. We've seen a lot of things happen, not only in the state of Michigan, but uh, around the country, uh, based on things that we as a congregation are doing. So it's, uh, it's very much worth the effort. It's a lot of work, but it's very much worth the effort. I've posed this question to all of our guests so far. How would you describe Christians and their role within the civic realm? Well, you know, you're talking about engagement uh, necessarily. And uh, when we're talking about engaging in the public square, we're talking about people actually stepping up and doing what it is that the Lord would require us to do relative to faithfulness in the public square, Uh, whether that's standing for uh, moral law, standing for natural law, um, doing what St. Paul implies uh, in texts like First Timothy chapter 2, uh, where we pray for uh, those in authority, we intercede, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Paul uh, implying there uh, the necessity of maintaining a context for religious liberty for the sake of evangelism, for uh, making sure that the gospel has a societal context uh, for being extended in the world. Um, so it, it's very much something that Christians should be doing. Uh, it's something that should be a part of their lives. Uh, in in almost every way. In fact, I don't want to ramble on too much about it, but one thing uh, I'm rather insistent on is that so much of what's happening in the public square is in a very base way, um, or in a very basic way, already Christological. And so a lot of uh, these topics, life, you know, even education, you know, there are things that we can talk about in the church relative even to taxation or immigration or things that have Christological aspects to them. And if something is Christological, then the church already owns it. Um, So it's something that we have a duty to be talking about and engaging in. What's your understanding of the separation of church and state? And how does the First Amendment serve both church and state? Well, there's there's a lot in those two questions. Let's dig in as best we can. So Saying even the phrase separation of church and state, right away, we are conjuring, of course, Thomas Jefferson's letter uh, to the Danbury Baptists in 1801, 1802, something like that, 
where he first uses that phrase, um, the wall of separation between church and state. But what a lot of people forget is that the Danbury Baptists actually wrote to Jefferson concerned about government intrusion. And what they wanted was for the government not to impose on their ability to worship freely. Uh, and Jefferson's reply was a commendation of this. Essentially, he was agreeing with them. So he's reassuring them of something that has already long been understood, which is that the government cooperates with the church in the sense that it's not going to impose on the church, but at the same time, it's defending the church's right to exist, uh, defending the church's right to perpetuate itself. Um, now, thinking out loud here, um, I just said this had long been understood. Um, we've long understood this. Well, what I mean by that, some of my doctoral work is, well, my doctoral thesis is essentially focusing on the separation of church and state in many ways. And the formal sense of church and state goes all the way back to the Edict of Milan, uh, 313. That's really one of the first places we actually see in print phrases that talk about the free exercise of religion, the freedom of the church, um, freedom uh, to cooperate or not cooperate with governing authorities, things like that. But now you follow the church and state thread up and through history, and along the way, you run into some pretty basic premises that are represented. So, for example, one of those is what the Danbury Baptists wanted, which was to protect the church from state intrusion and to protect also their clergy from political control, from being coerced, things like that. There are other premises, too, that we find. For example, there's the concern for protecting protecting the state from the church uh, or essentially to defend against theocracies, defend against dominionism, um, which are complete uniting. Uh, are, there are this complete uniting of government and religion together. And then you, you see in almost a, a more focused way, a more narrow way, a premise about the individual citizens. In other words, church and state uh, separation protects individuals against intrusion from both the church and the state. Uh, it should be doing these kinds of things. So with these uh, things sort of swirling around in history, asking maybe me what I think of church and state, it might even, the real question we're asking is what did the founders think of it? Because that's the context in which we're living. And, and when we do ask that question, we find them working from really two basic silos of thought. And this is the angle that I often take with our Body of Christ in Public Square conference. This is what I take when I'm out in the public square uh, trying to explain these things. Why would the church, why would a guy like me, a Lutheran pastor, be out here at a committee meeting or standing here at a, uh, you know, at a podium talking to a school board? The two basic silos of thought are essentially separationism and accommodationism. Now, separationism is exactly as it sounds. Separationism is assuming that the church and the state cannot commingle in any way, shape, or form. Accommodationism is the relative opposite of that. It understands, essentially, that the church and the state are interdependent. And for the sake of, maybe for the sake of a, a stable society, they have to work together at certain levels. And so here's the thing. The, none of the historical premises um, that I was talking about before, and there's, there's at least five, I would say. I, I really kind of only mentioned three, but none of them come close to establishing absolute separationism, like so many people would insist today. Um, absolute separationism is actually a recent innovation. It starts showing up on the scene in academia around the turn of the 19th century or so. Um, eventually, uh, it's that court case, the uh, Everson v. Board of Ed uh, court case in 1947, the Supreme Court case, that really sort of thrusts the whole discussion into the limelight, into the, the mainstream public limelight. In that case, um, if I remember correctly, was a New Jersey case. Um, it was concerned with school district reimbursements where they were giving state money to both the pro public school students and private school students, things like that. And there was someone upset about it. And so they brought a case. That's really the first time most people started to hear the term establishment clause as kind of a uh, sort of a mainstream phrase that people were being drawn to understand. And unfortunately, because of the heavy handed language uh, that was written into the majority opinion, which was written by Justice um, Hugo Black, who was also a devout separationist, 
uh, who learned his ideology as a member of the Ku Klux Klan, by the way. Black is the one who essentially made it so that the phrase um, Congress shall make no law, that, that phrase that uh, leads into the clause, he's really kind of the one that more broadly understood uh, this as all government of any kind, you know, of any, uh, in any form shall be completely cut off from all religion altogether. And so with that, it all just kind of goes downhill from there. The problem with this stuff is that the founders were not separationists. They just aren't. They're accommodationists. And how they came to this conclusion is a completely different discussion for another time. Um, I get into this discussion sometimes online with guys who will say, well, it's, it's, a, uh, it's deism or uh, originated or it's uh, the Age of Enlightenment or whatever. Philosophically, they're accommodationists. I'll just leave it at that. They understood the church and the state as inherently compatible as being in a relationship that is one of cooperation more so than enmity or as polar opposites in some way. I would argue, too, um, that in its most precise form, accommodationism actually arrives very, very close to Lutheranism. We're the ones who lay claim to the best extrapolation of church and state with Luther's Two Kingdoms do uh, doctrine, which is, in its essence, I, you've probably had guys on before to explain it, so I, I probably don't need to do that, but just for the sake of summary, in its essence, it understands quite logically that nothing could ever be wholly divided from its other parts. And yet each part has a duty. So in the two kingdoms doctrine, Christ rules both the sphere of government, the left hand, and the sphere of the gospel, the right hand. Both have unique duties. In the right hand kingdom, the gospel kingdom, that's where the Christians are made. The government doesn't make Christians. Uh, the gospel makes Christians. The church wielding that gospel or uh, serving under, the, uh, under Christ for the sake of the gospel, make, they make Christians. The left-hand kingdom maintains the order. It stems chaos, maintains moral, natural law boundaries, things like that. I mentioned before um, St. Paul, uh, his premise, I think in 1 Timothy 2, I, I want to come back to that because I think it's there that he's actually explaining the importance of concern for the government's relationship with Christians because of religious liberty's paramount importance. Paul is implying that with good rulers, comes a societal context for the free preaching and teaching of the only message that can save the entire world. So now, one more thing to think about. Uh, this lands, again, very close to home for us with Frederick Schaefer. And most uh, Lutheran listeners hopefully will know this. I know uh, Bishop Harrison uh, did an article on it, uh, or wrote a letter uh, that was in Lutheran uh, Witness not that long ago, a couple years ago maybe, where he talked about Frederick Schaefer, the Lutheran pastor in New York. He presided over the cornerstone laying ceremony for a Lutheran church there, St. Matthew, 1820s, something like that. So after the ceremony, he sends the sermon that he wrote and preached, he, and, and it had a crisp explanation of Luther's Two Kingdoms theology. He sent this sermon off to James Madison, and surprisingly, Madison wrote back, essentially saying that America itself was proof of Luther's Two Kingdoms theology's wisdom and, and how America was also, also a disproof of the polar extremes of things like separationism, dominionism. He's nice enough to say that those extremes are well-meaning. I mean, they are, if you want to give them the benefit of the doubt. But nevertheless, he insists they're false and the Two Kingdoms doctrine is true. So in summary, my, my perspective on church and state is an accommodationist one. I understand and confess that the church and the state, while completely distinct, as wonderfully understood by the two kingdoms doctrine, they are distinct. However, there are ways and places and times and, and various uh, gray areas where they cross over and they support one another. They promote one another. They work together for the benefit of society. Pastor, what's at stake, particularly for Christians, if the First Amendment is misinterpreted, or we fail to uphold it? Well, it's already being misinterpreted. Um, there's already this mass scale failure in upholding it. I've read several articles even today, um, this morning, Christian schools being targeted. I saw a mother and a father, their child was taken away from them 
um, because they were against these uh, hormone blockers, the sex change uh, treatments that they were going to be given. So it's already happening. Christian schools, you know, social agencies, they're all being sued. Some are closing. Certain types of religious speech are already outlawed in certain communities. So essentially, certain biblical perspectives that are typically communicated through speech um, are being, it's all being criminalized. And this is already dreadfully true in places like Canada and England, Scotland, but it's happening here too in the United States. You know, so specifically speaking, maybe what's at stake? Well, religious liberty is at stake. Essentially, the First Amendment's establishment and the free exercise clauses are protecting an individual's rights to practice religion freely. And so for starters, when this stuff is misinterpreted or we fail as a nation to uphold it, um, this failure is going to lead to things like restrictions on worship or religious gatherings. You only have to look back at 2020 to see what I'm talking about. Um, it leads to laws that limit Christian teaching on issues like marriage and family and gender. It leads to Christians being forced to act against their conscience in ways that contradict everything that they believe. My friend Jack Phillips um, being sued into oblivion still to this day. He's been sued for 10 straight years for initially refusing to bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. You know, if we let these things get by us or we don't engage in the public square, we'll see the erosion of moral, ethical frameworks that have historically informed our society. You know, Christianity has been a historical source for American legal and cultural value systems. If the First Amendment is undermined or weakened, Christian perspectives on ethics, on morality, on what um, is appropriate in public discourse, these things can be sidelined. And, and then you start seeing the denigration of the sanctity of life, of human dignity, of marriage. I think actually one of the most tragic byproducts uh, when this kind of stuff is happening is that it, it alienates Christians from public life. And this kind of goes back to the, one of the first things I said about Christological topics. Uh, this is a massive reversal when you bully Christians into thinking that they don't belong in the public square because their concerns are, are religion based. All of these topics that are, that are at least are at the forefront these days are all Christological. Again, the church and the Christians already own them. And so we belong in the public square. But, you know, what are we seeing happen? We're seeing discrimination against, against us. We're seeing that happening to our religious institutions, Christian schools, churches, charities being denied funding. Um, I read an article this morning about that. They end up facing discriminatory regulations. They're excluded from public forums and programs, and they can't get money maybe that they were going to get before until they conform uh, to the governance or to these uh, progressive ideologies, uh, especially when it comes to things like hiring policies that maybe conflict with Christian teaching. I mentioned before ev evangelism. That's a huge one. Look at England and Scotland right now. The street preachers uh, in these countries are going to jail for offending listeners who disagree with the premise of homosexuality or transgenderism or something like that. The preachers are preaching against these things, homosexuality, transgenderism, calling it a sin. But then they're also saying that Christ can and he does free us from those sins. They're being thrown in jail for this. And what's, I think, kind of interesting is that the people throwing him in jail, these magistrates and these lawyers, were all sworn into their office with one hand on a King James Bible. So it's like... You know, it, it's such a strange thing. Um, but here in America, plenty of Christians' social media posts are tagged, violating community standards. I mean, this list goes on and on and on of all of the kinds of terrible things that can happen if we're not maintaining or speaking out or engaging in ways uh, specifically relative to the First Amendment. So I guess what I'm saying, any misinterpretation or any failure on anybody's part to uphold the First Amendment risks essentially undermining the ability to live out our faith freely, to do it publicly um, without fear of government interference. And the stakes in the end are not just legal. They're deeply rooted in who we are as Christians. In our Christian identity, our mission, our, our moral expression, if you want to say it, within the broader culture, when we lose this stuff, the ability to communicate these things, and let's say in a long-term sense, 
when it fades from our Christian consciousness, and it will, the less we do it, the less we, we engage with it out there with us, we eventually lose who we are and we lose our identity. And this is something that really all Christians, not just some, but all Christians need to be engaging to protect these things. There can't be this kind of this diffusion of responsibility. We all need to get into the game. We all need to be playing hard, engaging in this way, protecting that First Amendment. What would you say to someone who says, well, uh, you can't make abortion a religious issue, uh, or you can't let your religion, your Christianity to be specific, affect how you vote on these things because they're two different things. How do you respond to that? I might turn it back around and say, well, how do you not let those things affect your life? Um, If you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, um, your life is built on the Holy Spirit or the, the faith given to you by the power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel. And the Holy Spirit is no skeptic on these issues. He's not confused on these issues. Luther said that. He said the Holy Spirit is not a skeptic. He's not confused uh, about these issues. Uh, and so we, as God's people, led by the Holy Spirit in faith, don't have to be either. We don't have to be confused as to the importance of what life actually means. Uh, we don't have to be bothered or, or concerned in a uh, frightful way um, that these particular topics, again, are somehow owned by the rest of the world and are not something that we don't have any right to speak to. Um, In fact, we have the ultimate responsibility to be the ones to, uh, and maybe go in a direction with somebody like Bonhoeffer. When, When these kinds of things are going off the rails, it's the job of the Christians to take a stick and put it in that wheel and stop it. Uh, where it is. Uh, And that's very much, I think, a very solid understanding of the two kingdoms. The the government can't fix the church if the church is going off the rails. This is maybe the stranger part of the dichotomy. The government doesn't fix the church when it's going off the rails. The church reforms itself by God's grace with his uh, redeeming love. He, He sends those who will help there. But when the government is going off the rails, it's actually the job of the Christians to help that government get back on track and maintain faithfulness to its ordination. So all of these different angles, all of these different things, we we can't say we don't play a part in it in some way. Um, We we have a voice and we should be using it. We should be uh, using it in the public square. What are some ways then, maybe apart from us voting on certain policies to protect our religious liberties, what are some other ways that Christians can work to protect their Christian consciences as we live under the current public policy, under the current legislation, what can we do? And this is, again, apart from simply casting votes, what can we do that would be proactive to defend our religious liberties? Well, this is a great, um, great question. And this is a very important one because it's one thing to be able to point the finger and diagnose the problems. It's something altogether to say, here's how you can play a role in fixing it. One of the main things that a lot of people can do um, is just be informed. You can't really be active in any way if you don't know what's going on. Um, So being informed is incredibly important. Uh, Know what's going on locally, know what's going on nationally, know the various legislations that impact religious freedom. Sometimes um, we think, well, it's just so complicated, and in many ways it is, and that's, that's deliberate the forces that are aligned against us are trying to complicate these things in a lot of different ways. So being informed necessitates being active. It means participating not only in the elections, but it means meeting your legislators, talking with them, going to meetings, attending public hearings, going to school board meetings, finding out for yourself what's being said and what's actually being done. So being informed, um, being active is critical. From there, um, I think what I would say is, uh, is continued on the line of, of activity. Christians should be advocating for stronger legal protections for the church. So what I mean by that is you know what's going on, you're aware of the, of the legislation, and so you're engaging or partnering with various groups uh, to support legislation at, again, at local, state, federal levels 
that's going to protect your religious freedom, uh, conscience clause uh, protections for like healthcare workers or educators or, you know, working with and supporting those groups that actually get out on the front lines and fight for the churches and for Christians. Groups like Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, um, or the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, or here in Michigan, the uh, Salt Lake Global, um, that's a, a group, Will Wagner, a guy that I know well. So advocating there, supporting those groups. Do your best uh, to understand what's going on and then in a actually engage in the civil dialogue. You know, don't be afraid to step up and have a conversation where conversations are needed. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to storm a meeting and throw your opinion out on a, on a microphone at a podium somewhere. Uh, but what it does mean is that when you're sitting with family at Thanksgiving and there's a division there and these topics come up, you're not afraid to have a civil dialogue with the people that you love, uh, where you can do what you can as a godly person to help recalibrate the discussion so that it's, it's founded on faithfulness rather than opinion. And uh, I think that's an absolute, what absolutely one of the best ways to do it. It starts with us in our vocation, um, wherever we are, whatever we're doing. You know, the, uh, aside from that, we could, we could expand out thinking of it now. You know, I am the pastor of a tuition-free preschool through eighth grade school in Michigan. It's a big job, but it's a very important job. It's a very important thing that we're doing here. But I'm also pastor uh, of a school in a state where abortion is now enshrined in the Constitution. Prop 3 a couple of years ago just made it so that at abortion all the way up to and, and in some cases after birth, depending upon how the law is interpreted, is a right of every woman in the state of Michigan. But at the same time, on its heels, um, the Elliot Larson, the Civil Rights Act, was revamped here. And it redefined the word sex to mean now gender orientation, gender preference, uh, things like that. So what does that mean for me as a Christian school, a pastor of a Christian school? It means that it is, it's a criminal act on our part if we hire or fire based on someone's gender preferences. It's now law in the state of Michigan. A lot of people don't necessarily know that. Uh, but that's the fact. Christians can support and, and run defense on these things when they go again and talk to their legislators, when they really try to push back on these kinds of things, but even more so when they support financially these types of organizations. Or just send your kids there. Become a part of that community. Be someone who actually bolsters uh, that effort rather than seeing it become something where people are shrinking from it because they're terrified of the possibilities. Uh, that's more of an opportunity to lean into the headwinds rather than to be pushed back by them. Something else I'd say is just maintain that clear Christian witness. Live out your faith. Do it with integrity. Do it with kindness. Do it with courage. You got to navigate a lot of stuff, but the, the great thing about it is that we have the upper hand on truth so we can. Um, we can love other people while we're talking with them, and we can, uh, even those ones that we deeply disagree with, we can love them, and we can be an emblem of Christ to them in ways that the world just can't, can't do it. Finally, Pastor, as we wrap up, what's some encouragement that you can give or some godly biblical wisdom that you can offer our listeners as they navigate the world, our culture, our polity in the U.S.? that's increasingly hostile to our Christian faith? Well, I, I would come back around, I guess, to something I said already, and that's to be that uh, clear Christian witness in the world. That would be the advice that I would give. I, I, I would say that, you know, Romans 13, let's think on that for just a quick second. Romans 13 is a text that a lot of pastors, a lot of Christian teachers will go to relative to our responsibility to the government. Um, beautiful text, of course. It's teaching that the government authority is instituted by God. Christians are to respect it, obey it. Paul's words there are prescriptive, not necessarily descriptive. And knowing that, we do understand that obedience to the government has its limits. We have Acts chapter 5, verse 29, that is clearly showing us that we must obey God 
rather than men. Encouraging Christians to know that. Yes, yes, respect authority. Respect authority. But remember, relative to the two tables of the, of the law, the Ten Commandments, we cannot live in this world and love our neighbor unless we love God more. We don't get to commandments four through ten before going through commandments one through three. We must obey God rather than men. We will love our neighbors as we ought to when we love God most. And we take that out into the civic arena, and that's how we engage. And what I think ends up happening when that's the case is that we become those things that Christ describes in the Sermon on the Mount. We become peacemakers. We become those people who are striving not to cause war, but rather to reconcile uh, differences in society. We become those who are healing divisions, who are fostering the kinds of unity that God wants uh, in our midst. And then uh, we find that we're capable of engaging in politics with integrity. Um, we, we can be honest. We, we can be humble. We can have that servant mindset. Uh, we can maintain the boundaries of those things that deserve that stuff, like human dignity and life and, and care for the poor or whatever. Uh, and then finally, finally, we recognize that we're being watched. We are being watched. Matthew 5, uh, we are salt of the earth. We are lights. Uh, we are light of the world. Christians are called to influence society for the sake of the gospel. People will see us and they will give glory to the Father in heaven. This is, this is our life in the world around us. And when, when we've got these things in mind, um, the Holy Spirit stirring and maintaining them within us, we'll be okay. We will be okay. Come what may, we'll be okay. I guess I have one more question, which I said finally before, but finally, finally, <laughs> Pastor. Yeah. How do we look to Christ through November 2024, through January 2025? How do we look to Christ as the world turns and things happen, whether they're in favor of protecting Christians and their conscience or not? How does keeping our eyes on Jesus help Christians despite what's going on in the world around us? Well, keeping our eyes on Christ is to keep our eyes, I would say, on the cross. It is to understand that life in this world is not necessarily meant to be easy. If we're following Christ because we think it's going to be easy, then we are we're really missing out on what Christianity is, uh, is all about. Um, that's not the goal. When we set our hearts and our minds, our eyes on Christ, we're seeing that he, first and foremost, has won our salvation. Um, we are not inheritors of this world. We are inheritors of the world to come. And it's by that gospel strength we can, To uh, I mentioned Bishop Harrison before, we can, as I've heard him say in other places, we can experience that um, or know that courage that he calls baptized fear. We're baptized. We're God's people. We can, uh, by God's grace, endure. Christ didn't promise it would get easier. He, uh, he promised it would get harder. And he wasn't being, or he, he promised it could be harder. He wasn't also being negative and saying everything's going to come undone. Even as he said somewhat rhetorically to his disciples, uh, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? I mean, it's very possible that we'll, things will conti continue to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. But we're not out to produce numbers. We're not out to uh, produce results that make us comfortable. We're out to produce faithfulness. Uh, and when we already know that faithfulness is by the power of the Spirit, we can, again, we can set our sails and, and go forth into any storm. Uh, and so that's what we do. We hold the line, stand firm in faithfulness to Christ, and we do it uh, by his grace in love as best as we can in love. Thank you, Pastor. And thank you so much for being my guest today. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follow or subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at LCMS Life. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. 
Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that discusses the life God has given and the people he has called you to serve right where you are in God's mission. Thank you.